Good evening. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this live on Bridges of Light International. Hello, Chiara. Hello, welcome. We're going to be together one hour and we are going to be talking about what lies beyond problems and opportunities. Hello, Natasha, welcome. We're gonna wait a few more moments until more people connect. In the meantime, hello Mariella, welcome. Thank you. In the meantime, I'd like to welcome you. Hello Valeria, for being here with us this hour. And hello to you and thank you that you're watching this uh, whenever you're watching this. <laughs> thank you Bridges of Light and thank you life itself. How would you define um, a problem? What is a problem for you? And I'm looking forward to read what you write, by the way. <laughs> because I, I want to make it a, a live. I don't want to make it a monologue. So I'd like us to define, to think about what are problems, what are opportunities, and then we're going to be talking about what could be beyond either of them. So we've got the problems, we've got the opportunities, and what do we have beyond it, beyond them? What's there, if anything? Hello, Sylvia. Sylvia, what are problems for you? How would you define problems? Without looking in the dictionary, Natasha says, something far from our comfort and difficult for us. Yeah, I like that explanation. Something far from our comfort and difficult for us. Mm -hmm. And what is an opportunity, Natasha? How would you define a opportunity? Ciao Luca, welcome. Luca, what is a problem for you? How would you define a problem? And how would you define or describe an opportunity synthetically? Mariela says something we create in our mind. Mm -hmm. Natasha says the opportunity could be the same problem viewed from a different point. Mm -hmm. Any other takers? Anybody else has got any other opinions? Sylvia says an opportunity is a problem viewed from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, did I see Guglielmo there? Guglielmo, how would you define synthetically a problem and how would you define an opportunity? If you're there, of course. I thought I saw your, boom, your, your picture coming up. Marina says, something we create and definite in our mind. Or we create and define in our mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another question. Show me, show me, literally, show me problem. Can you show me problem? Or, and, can you show me opportunity?
you can show me, we can show people what we regard, what we believe to be a problem. We can show people what we believe, what we interpret, what we judge as being a problem or a opportunity. But problem per se, we can't show it. As a matter of fact, not even opportunity we can show. Mariela says, I can't stand that job. Problem. Chiara says, no, I can't show. Exactly. We can talk about, we can intellectualize, we can rationalize about something for us being a problem. But like some of you have already written, what now or before was considered a problem then could be considered, can be considered a opportunity. So ultimately, either problems and opportunity in, in, let's say, in absolute reality, they don't exist. Like some of you wrote already, they only exist in our mind. Natasha said, well, thinking about them look the same. They look the same. But yes, they are the same. Yes, they are the same. Because they have one common denominator. And that is the common denominator of all life experience. It's what is, or you could call it reality, or you could call it uh, fact, actual fact, concrete, uh, well, yes, concrete reality. What is concrete reality? Concrete reality is uh, here where I am, I'm in a room, there's four walls, there's pictures behind me, there's a cardboard, okay, I'm sitting on a chair, this is a concrete reality. Um, somebody is just born, somebody died, um, I got a new job, I lost my job. Yes, it's our attitude to name them, yes. When we truly, and I mean, not just intellectually. It, yes, intellectually it's important, it's a first step, but it's not enough. In other words, we all, we, <laughs> we all know intellectually what we are talking about, I guess, definitely us. There's very people nowadays that they don't know what we're talking about, that they don't know that, yes, it's how we view a situation that we can, if the situation is, let's say, the, lo the loss of a job, and it's up to me to think, oh, I am unlucky, so I see a problem, or, oh, maybe now I have more time for myself, I can find another job that I like more, so I see a opportunity. But, it's a different story to literally to embody, the, to embody this awareness. And we know when we have really interiorized and embodied this awareness, when either we are literally unfazed by everything that happens to us, like the man with the, that was living with the son with the horse, the story I told you before, I might tell you quickly now again, or when we have a mind which is very flexible, very fluid and very creative and can only, because we choose to, to see only opportunities and never problems. So, and how do we know that at an emotional level? When we are literally unperturbed about what happened or excited about everything that happened. If we find ourselves being upset, being anxious, being frustrated, that means that we haven't really understood at a deep level what we're talking about. And that's why I normally always, there's a common thread about the things we talk about. And the common thread is normally this 
ability of interpreting and looking at what happens in either in a neutral way or how we desire it to be. But it's a process. It's something that it doesn't normally happen from one day to the next. It's something we have to work upon. But let me write, let me read what you write and then I'll tell you the story if for who didn't, didn't listen to the story last time. Mariella says, I want to be a doctor. There is a step. I must win uh, the concourse. Uh, if you in the test, I think, opportunity. I want to be a doctor. There is a step. I must win that, of course, opportunity. Yes, the fact that we see opportunities or problems, it's very much due to what we want to achieve, what we want, and how we interpret what, what we have to do. But um, for whoever hasn't, hasn't heard this story before, here is somebody that can see beyond problems and opportunities. Um, it's a story of this man that lives with his son and uh, in the countryside, they have one horse. Uh, one day, the only horse that they have run away. So the neighbors go to the man and they tell him, oh, you are so unlucky. We are really sorry for you. That's really bad what happened to you. And he looks at them and he goes, is it so? Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. Two days later, the, his, do, his horse comes back with other 20 horses. So now he's got 21 horses. So the neighbors go, go to him and tell him, oh, you are so lucky, that's wonderful. You see, now you've got 21 horses. And he looks at them and he goes, is it so? Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. The week later, one of the horses kicks, uh, kicks his son in his leg. So his, his son has got a broken leg, so he can't work. Again, the neighbors go to the man and tell him, oh, you are so lucky, unlucky, this is so terrible. And the old man looks at them and he goes, maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. Is it so? I don't know. The nation goes to war and of course his son, because he was injured by his leg, he doesn't have to go to the, in, to, to, in the battlefield. So you see what I mean. You get the hang of it, right? Right, but you know. So what we can do is either to use our mind like somebody, some of you already brought, we can reinterpret the same situation in a, view the same situation in a different light. And for example, if any of you has ever experienced this, uh, share your experience. In other way, tell us, let us know when you um, had a life, when something happened in life and you so you perceived whatever happened as being a problem. And then what did you do and how is it that you see the opportunity in it? What happened? What did you do? Did something happen? Did you do anything? If anything of that kind has happened to you, please share it. I'm curious about it. And not just me, everybody else. Because what is more important than anything here, it's not so much me telling you about, yes, it is important as well, about my experience. But what is important is that whoever is on this group shares experiences. So if somebody else can actually see how whatever we talk about, it can be put into action in real life. And it's not just a concept. There's a fundamental question that predetermines though, if we are automatically, by default, seeing problems or opportunities in life. And the question is, what is my relationship with the present moment? Do I feel, do I believe 
that the present moment, meaning what is happening right here, right now, is it something negative, something that should not happen, or am I aware that what is happening now is happening because it's the most appropriate and perfect thing for it to happen? And this choice, this relationship with the present moment, it is something that we can intentionally decide and choose right here and now, and we can make this choice now up to forever next. And this is the shortcut. This is when we won't even need anymore to use our mind to reinterpret a situation. Because when we have to, when we use our mind to reinterpret the situation, normally, of course, it's never too late <laughs> because everything can be done. But we normally do it after we have seen the problem, we have reacted negatively, of course, because we thought there was a problem. And then, of course, maybe we find a solution. So after we find the solution, we can see that there was an opportunity into the problem, okay? Which is obvious because even though we had, even with a negative attitude, even if we have a negative mindset, uh, it's a mathematical fact. Fact that pro there isn't a problem without the solution. If a problem didn't have a solution, it wouldn't have be a problem. So even if in the worst of the in, in the worst case scenario, there will always be a solution to the situation we are facing. To speed up that process, one question that I find it's very, very effective is to ask ourselves what good is coming out of this? What is the hidden gift? And that allows me, or allows my subconscious mind to be looking for the opportunity, to be looking for the hidden gift. Of course, of course, sometimes it's not so easy. And especially when the negative emotions has already taken over me. Because when I feel a strong negative emotions, I am not present enough, so I don't, I can't have a relationship with the present moment, and I am not um, emotionally balanced and clear-headed to make any sort of um, objective decisions. So normally, I just, I can only feel the negative charge of the negative emotion, and then, and only then, I can then ask myself the appropriate question and change my perspective. Mariella says, it's scientifically demonstrated. We use our brain less than our capacities. So really, if we want, we can be so creative, have lots of prospects for our life. We can find solutions, having positive attitudes. Yes, yes, we are, it's only because we are trained to look at the negative sides of things. We are trained not to think, mainly. Uh, if you think about it, kids in school, they are, they are encouraged to learn some information and then they have to learn, yes, they have to memorize the information and then they have to give back the information that they have acquired. But very rarely at school, uh, maybe things have changed, but normally, generalizing, when I went to school, uh, we weren't asked, for example, Luca or Mariella, what is your opinion about this? What is it that you think about this? No. Actually, that, that's not something this, this, uh, the school systems really want. Because if we ask, if we ask children to... Um, to develop their opinion 
and to become creative and authentic, they would grow up becoming individuals. But society, structured society as it's structured uh, globally, doesn't want individuals. They want personalities. It's a different, it's a very, it's very different. Hello, Adriana. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll see you later. It's very different. And the difference is that an individual uh, is autonomous. He can think with his own head. And we, can, we could create individuals, uh, kids, if we were asking them, exactly like uh, Mariela says, uh, if we were training them simply to ask them questions, like, no, we, okay, we would have to encourage them to ask themselves questions, meaning we would have to tell the kids, what do you think about this? Ask yourself, what is your opinion? What, how would you do this? Okay, but kids, we kid, we kill kids' creativity, which is true, they would, they would solve almost any problems, our mind could solve any problems by this. But what happened is that when kids start uh, growing up and they want to do things in their own way, adults normally, and school is very good at doing that, they say, no, 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 I'll show you, I'll teach you the right way of doing this which of course, it's also out of love because we think we want to make things easy, easier for the kids, for the children, but we don't. Because the kids, what does it do? He, he, he acquire a mental mindset or a formula to do something and doesn't develop his problem solving, solving abilities. So when he's faced then in life with a situation which is a little bit out of the norm, he or she goes into freeze mode. He doesn't know how to solve the problems because maybe it's not, uh, it doesn't uh, fall into one of the categories of the problem solving methods that he, he learned from parents, from school or from adults. Do you see what I'm getting at? As if, if we let a kid to be creative, to mean, to, in other words, to say, okay, you do it your own way, you can solve, you can, whatever, you can do whatever you do, want to do in your own way. You know what? Kids will become A, individual, and B, geniuses, literally geniuses, because a, a genius, by the way, it's just a, somebody that uh, is way of thinking, it's really uh, freestyling. It can make association very easily because he's learned, because he's got a very flexible mind, because he knows that he has the power to overcome any challenge, any problems. And of course, when we know that we can overcome any challenge and any problems, then automatically we won't see problems and challenges anymore, but we will always see what? Opportunities. Opportunities to do what? Opportunities to, to become more, to show more of our inner skill, the skill that we own, which is like, um, how do I do this? How do I overcome the obstacle? Like somebody mentioned on somebody like, how do I pass the test, the test, the, the test that I have to take to become a doctor? So life would be exciting instead of believing that life is a chore. So everything would, would be different if we were truly, the, if we were taught how to think by ourselves, how to be creative. Natasha is saying, I have my problems at work. I look at them through a window and I just, and I just saw deep black. The lockdown gifted myself to me and now I look at them seeing the nature through the windows. How beautiful that is. That's a beautiful metaphor. Yes, I like this. And also, Natasha, are you saying that, that the lockdown has become an opportunity for you. Am I right? Yes, because it gifted you. And now you, instead of seeing the problem, you see nature through the windows, where before you were looking, you were seeing something deep black. That is a beautiful, beautiful example of how we can 
go from seeing a problem to seeing an opportunity. And this is something that when we know we can do it once, we can do it any other time. But watch this space. If we are not able to do it, and it could be, it could be that, okay, this time at work or because of the COVID, the problem at work became an opportunity. But then maybe there's another challenge in, in a relationship we have. And if we don't manage to do this easily, then what we can ask ourselves is, what is the gain that I have in believing in the problem or what I could what seeing as a problem? In other words, it's called secondary gain. gain. Sometimes people, I'm not saying that you are one of them. I just want you to present you with different scenarios that you may have been in the scenario, you may be, or you may see somebody that is in that scenario. Sometimes, even though our mind knows that I can see a problem, a opportunity where I used to see a problem, if we can do that, it could be that there is a, sometimes it's very unconscious, that's why I want, it throw, I want to throw this out there that you can think about, your subconscious mind might think about it. There may be an, a, um, a, a reward, so to speak, an unconscious um, gain from having the problem, from believing in the problem and from the challenge that the problem uh, offers. I give you an example. Uh, to feel like a victim, for example, in a relationship or at work or in, in, in a particular context, for some people it's a strategy, of course, unconscious, to get what? To get, which is not pure, um, compassion and empathy, but they get a surrogate or compassion and empathy or empathy or attention from people at work, from families, from friends. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? So for these people, it would be very difficult. And my word, when I say this, they would either get upset or they would think, oh, that's all bunch of bullshit. This is a real problem, which of course they could see the problem and reinterpret it in, a, in an instant. But if they get something emotionally important for them, it's not as simple as it is. Do I make any sense? This is to say that, as always, we can... It's easier said than done. It's easy when we are clear-headed, when we are in a state of emotional serenity, then we can play with our mind and we can flip the... Let's say that the, the, whatever we have, the, the problem and the opportunity, we'll look at, at any side. But when there is a deep emotional involvement, uh, it's not so easy. And also something else that I want to, you to uh, keep in mind regarding problems and opportunities is this. You know, when you have to paint a house, okay, and let's say the, the wall is not so clean. So you know that one coat of paint is not enough. You have to give it like two, three or four coats of paint. I imagine that after you gave the first coat of paint, you have to wait, right? Until it dries before you give the second coat. Then you give the second coat of paint and you, and you, you wait. Then you give the third coat and you wait, okay? If you don't respect this timing, you say if you don't wait for the paint to set, you're gonna make a mess. Also, if we have to, if you're looking, uh, cooking a cake, we put all the ingredient in the container, we put it in the oven, and then we have to wait until the, the cake um, rises. I'm not, I can't think of the right word in English, but you know, the levitate. Otherwise, if we take it out before it levitate, and if we put, let's say, the cream and the fruit on top, again, it would be a flop. It, we wouldn't be doing it appropriately. This is to say that either when we are experiencing and believing we are facing a problem, or if somebody is facing a problem, it's very important not to even try to... Uh, 
change the, 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 the perspective or to reinterpret it in a different way and to find or, or to see the opportunity because we wouldn't be willing to and we wouldn't be able to and also if somebody's having a problem and we are the, the party that wants to help them respect the fact that if they are in shock let's say something has happened and they regard it as being a problem they lost a job or somebody near them died wait let's not even try to sugarcoat was that what happened or saying it's not a problem can you see the gift in it or whatever no they would they, we would even add, add problem to the problem it's important as if the paint has to dry or the cake has to levitate to just be present create the space for us or for them to just be and allow these emotions, this upset to do its course. And then, then yes, we can use our mind to reinterpret the situation. We ask ourselves, what is the hidden gift? What is the opportunity here? But only after the emotional charge is gone. <clears throat> in fact, you may have experienced this. If you have ever been in uh, dealing with somebody that is angry, is really angry, really upset, or you may have been upset, and you see there's no point in talking to somebody when they're really angry. Maybe they're telling you, they're complaining about something, and you can see that they, they're literally, they have to let the emotion out, the anger out. So there's no point for us to tell them anything because we would add fire to the fire. So what do we do? You just let them deflate. They go, they go, and you're just there. You're just there. You don't say anything. Or if anything, you, you validate what they say. Okay? And then afterwards, they are maybe <laughs> able and willing to listen. They are present. But we have to allow the emotion to subsude. Otherwise, they won't be able to listen. And the same applies for us. If, we are, if you are going through a challenging time now in an area of your life and there's still an alive raw emotion there, my advice is it's great what we talk about. Remember it, but don't even try if it's too soon to do it. Does it make sense? Because it will make a mess. Meaning, now just what you, I would invite you to do, or to tell somebody if it's going through a challenging time, say, yes, I am feeling, and acknowledge the feeling, yes, I am feeling frustrated. Yes, I am feeling sad. Yes, I am feeling hangry. Yes, I am feeling whatever you're feeling. But it's important to acknowledge the feeling, to establish, a positive relationship with the present moment, which it is, I am feeling this emotion, so I'm not um, um, resisting it. I'm allowing it to be. Because you see, when imagine I'm pushing with my hand. Can you see my hand? I'm pushing. If we did with this other hand, I am resisting it. I, you know, I'm really pushing, and I'm, I'm getting very. Either of my hands are really getting exhausted and I'm getting exhausted because the more I push, I push with this, the more this one wants to push and it becomes a fight, a fight, a battle. But this is what we normally do. Something that we don't like happens or we feel an emotion we don't like and we, start, we try to um, resist it. We say, oh, I shouldn't be feeling like this or I don't want to feel like this. But you know, what do you resist, persist, get stronger and controls you? One of the basic fundamental principle of transformation, you know what it says? It says that if you allow, if a thing appears in space and time in front of you, and if you allow it to be without interfering with it, it will pass. Everything shall pass and it will transform itself. You see, if the hand is here, I just let it go. 
This is very important. This is to be, to, meaning if something happens, there's nothing we can do. There's no point in arguing with reality. We're thinking, I wish that didn't happen. Let's say, I wish I didn't lose my job or I wish that person didn't die, it happened. But then, what happened? We feel the emotion, we may feel anger, we may feel sadness. It here, the same principle apply. Allow it to be. Be present with it. Stay with it. And I know it can be very, very, very challenging. It can be very, very uncomfortable because we are driven to go towards pleasure and to go away from pain but pain is a fact of life okay suffering no i'm the first one to saying we don't need to suffer but suffering is caused by the story we tell ourselves about the pain but the pain the raw pain has to be heard has to be felt otherwise it gets locked in ourselves and the pain is Normally, it's felt by what I call, it's, it's a primary emotion. It's like sadness, it's like anger, it's like frustration, and it's a reaction to what is alive there and there in the present moment. Now, if we are willing and able to stay with it, we don't even ask ourselves at this stage, if it's easy a problem, is it an opportunity? Who cares? Just be with it. Just feel it. Yes, I am feeling upset. Yes, I am feeling frustrated, yes, I'm feeling angry or whatever it is, then let it go. If we don't do that properly, what happens is that we create then, and that's when the suffering comes in, uh, what is called the second emotion, which is that kind of frustration or upset that we are still feeling maybe months after we have lost the job, years after the person has died. But this upset, this frustration or this sadness, it is not a primary emotion anymore. And to deal with it is much more uh, challenging and problematic because then we have to go to the primary emotion that we suppressed. Do I make any sense? <laughs> so, but this is going back to say that allow yourself to feel what you feel. Don't even go into is a problem, is an opportunity. Just feel it. And then, and only then, only when you reach a state of serenity, maybe you're exhausted, yes, maybe you're not happy, but you are, you're deflated, you're tired, but you are, there's no live emotion in you. Then yes, then play with your mind, then use your mind and, and see the situation in the way you choose to see, to see it. Um, Natasha Day is go then going on and writing. The problems are the same. I have changed. Staying alone with Natasha. Fantastic, yes. Yes, so you use the lockdown to go inside and stay with you. You found yourself, if I understand it properly. But yeah, absolutely, the problems are the same. The facts are the same. Whatever was there at work hasn't changed. And this is the key, this is the secret of, this is becoming a master. This is what a master do. And a master is simply somebody that is, who knows who she or he, he is and who, how he or she wants to live. It's somebody that is imperturbable, so to speak. It's somebody that it says to life, actually a master says, okay, another problem, another challenge, bring it on, bring it on. Because this is how the master grows. The master knows that there's not problems, there's no opportunity, that is only something that happens. And I have the power <clears throat> to determine my attitude towards it. So wonderful, Natasha. Thank you for sharing that. Mariella says, you, society, you can't put children under your schematic systems. They are so free, spontaneous, natural. Yes, they are. They are. But unfortunately, I would say, society is put, putting them under the schematic system. But yes, they, I, I agree with you. It's, 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 it's madness. It's total madness. I believe that if we left children to really express who they truly are, which is they are literally their 
divinity itself and divinity when i say divinity i don't mean religious god i just mean uh, pure creation pure aliveness pure yeah creation pure authenticity and who knows but i again i don't know because we haven't tried yet but if we had more faith in life and if we allowed let's say from now on we allow children to be who they truly are without interfering and i really would say i i because i think nature as god is you know the only i think the only parameters are am i doing something which is pro life meaning which is enhancing my well-being and others well-being okay and life well-being or am i doing something that is limiting our well-being others will being or whatever so when we teach children and we we show them we teach them what it means but they know it naturally okay that there's consequences in life meaning if i blow a kiss to somebody or if i give them a caress or a gift if i'm generous i will get something back of the of, of a like and of course if i slap somebody or if i punch somebody i get something else in return but of course, the, it becomes really complex to, to do this on a global scale because we would have to be, all of us adults, would have to be the first to embody that, to really be able to teach that to children. Because nowadays still, there's lots of adults <clears throat> that they don't know this. Does it make sense? Do you see what I mean? There's lots of adults that they couldn't teach that to children because they are not in a, in a place which is so aware enough for them to, to teach this to children because they have maybe so many unresolved issues that, that they cannot teach them anything else than frustration, anger, because they haven't sorted it out in themselves. Do I make any, do I make any sense? So you see, it's ideologically, it would be great to say <clears throat> to everybody, yeah, allow your children to do whatever they want to do. But in some families, it, it wouldn't be it, it would be impossible because they they wouldn't really know what that means. To to, to get what I mean. Anyway, ciao Simo, hello Simo. Marie says, let them cool in the blood. They hated in first. They heat it in first. Let them cool in the yes, exactly. When somebody when an emotion is 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 uh, um, arises in us or in others, the most appropriate thing is let it cool, let the fire burn. That's it. Let the fire generate heat, and then only then we can do something. Then we can see whatever we want to then we can see the opportunity where there was a problem but when the emotions are so strong that they overpower our thinking the big engine the big creative engine is is our heart it's our emotions our mind it's it's minute in comparison to to to, to the electromagnetic waves emanated by our emotions <clears throat> that's why um to have resolved our issues, our past issues, it's fundamental. This is why whatever we're talking about, it's, it's great, it's useful to, to say, okay, is a problem I can see it as an opportunity. But for some people that it's easily done, maybe because they have already resolved their past issues, okay? They have reinterpret all the past problems of their life and they have seen now they can see where they used to see problems they see opportunities but if somebody hasn't done that job or hasn't done it yet meaning if things have happened and he or she is still thinking or maybe it hasn't even looked at them but he still it was thinking it was a problem and still feels it's a problem it, it won't be able to, to, to literally see a pro an opportunity now where there was a problem because this trapped energy, this anger, this frustration stays in us until 
we go back, or we, it doesn't have to be a, a, a huge job, but we have to really go and see what happened, maybe 10, 15, sometimes it's, we have to go back as, as long as when we were five years old. But if something happens in five years old, and for us was a trauma, and we still are carrying the negative energy of that trauma, and we ever release that energy, we haven't reinterpreted it. Now for an adult, we could look back and, and see that, hey, I'm an adult now, whatever happened is because it was perfect and appropriate to happen. And now I can see it as an opportunity. And then that energy transforms and then we get freer and freer and lighter. So our mind now is in a place where it can do this kind of work. But if we haven't made peace with our past problems and turned them into opportunities, it's difficult, it's unlikely that we can do that now. And this is why, and i tell you why I tell you, I want to tell you this, because from my perspective, I see people, I can be saying the same thing of working with different people and we are dealing with the same, uh, with the same uh, scenario, so to speak, meaning we are talking about seeing an opportunity where there was a problem, but why for some people it's easily done and for some people it's not easily done. Because we are all, and this is not a matter of being better or worse or farther ahead or, or behind to other people, but all of us in our own evolutionary process, we are at various different places. So it's, you can't, we can't really generalize. The dynamics are the same, yes, certain dynamics were that universal, but even the same dynamics applied to Marie or to Antonella or to Mariella, they could produce slightly different results or maybe the, the, they get resolved at different times. Do you see what I mean? So, uh, Antonella, say, Antonella is watching. Mariella says, playing the rules of victims is a deplorable strategy su to submit the others. It can be, yes, absolutely. You know, <laughs> When somebody is playing the victim role, unconsciously of course, but sometimes people do it even consciously, a victim is the worst of the perpetrators. I repeat it. When somebody doesn't get rid of the victim energy, it becomes the ultimate perpetrators. Because the victim has always got privileges in the mental egoistic world because a victim has already suffered. So the victim ha has got to have privileges. So the victim it, 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 who wants to be in, in a victim mode is placing himself or herself at a, at a very high level, at a very controlling level. So yes, and some people, I, even here, it, it's important to say people don't do it because they're nasty. They don't do it because they are, they, they do it on purpose. But people may be that they didn't get the attention they would have liked to have or they needed really when they were kids. They didn't get the attention. They didn't get the affection. They didn't get the love. What happened? Happens that maybe by chance or maybe because they wanted the attention something happened and they, they experienced to be the victim. So when they were a victim, they could get the attention from their parents or from other people that they never got before. So for them, in their head, they go, okay, if I want attention, I have to be a victim. So because our subconscious mind and our mind is it's so powerful, what does it do? It creates circumstances when we are victims because being a victim means for them is like being noticed, being loved, being cared for. But these people do it, believe me, not because they're nasty, because they haven't experienced the real thing. They haven't experienced real love because when they have a taste of real love, which is really difficult for them because at an unconscious level, somebody that is playing the victim roles, other people may play the game, but their essence knows and doesn't really want to get intimate with them. That's when it gets really tricky. 
but if they can get real love and attention to somebody and for example that's what somebody like that would go for example in therapy and the therapist has to be that person that knows the truth of who they really are and can connect with their essence can give them a taste of what they never had but when when and that is the promoter that is what really shifts everything if i am dealing with somebody like that and if i am because i know who they are i know their beauty i know their love their worth of being truly loved and seen and heard and if i can do that even just once or twice or whatever then of course if you see them more you, you develop a relationship with them then they they when they have a taste of the real thing that's wonderful the spell is broken then everything then they can work on it and they can really get their what they really want but until then that they, they only had the surrogate of the real thing which is love because we all want love believe me we can tell ourselves that we want fame some people say they want uh, money they want no they want love everybody wants love if and when in fact when somebody when people are really seeing love everywhere fame money success they may still be there but they're secondary thing and if they're not there we don't really care that much so anyway i hope i i was i got the message through hello walter ciao oh right, what am i doing aspetta i'm doing something stupid here okay mariela says because most parents decide for them they discriminate children their sons can request or not absolutely mariella yes i totally agree you're right because most parents decide for them yes the parents also uh, on, almost treat children not all of them but like as they own them so they decide as if they had like some puppets some toys yes yes and they discriminate children their sons can frequent or not they discriminate children their sons can frequent or not frequent or not yes i'm not sure what you mean here do you mean that they even decide the parents who we who the kids is gonna be seeing or not because most parents decide for them yes they discriminate children their sons can frequent or not I think you mean that they they decide for them. They even decide who, what what they do and who they chi frequentano. <laughs> who they who who they um who they socialize with. Yes. And that is um that is what society wants nowadays. Oh, thank you. Yes. That's what society wants. Exactly. Society is very in very structure um, to control the masses so of course if if a parent is not aware uh, what do they do they are controlled by the system and what they do because they are controlled that's what they learn and they want to control and and it really links with what marie your 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 writing you wrote playing a victim is a learned behavior absolutely it is a learned behavior yes like we learn control because we've been controlled we learned how to be a victim and then what do we do what we have learned we use it because in a way we don't really have much choice it was the easy way for us that's uh, that's how we were told things are and so this is how we believe things are and this is what we carry on doing and it's not easy when and especially when somebody is an adult it's possible but it's not easy to think stop i now want to become free i want to become autonomous uh, but when we do that we can then choose to see opportunities where we used to see problems and we can choose never to be victims again or never to control anybody again and we what would we do we would go back 
to where we were when we were kids. We would go back to being ourselves. For some people, it's easier that. And when it's easier, it's easier when some children have been experiencing themselves for long enough to get a real good taste of it. Let's say they were really free, they were, they were starting to be creative, and then of course, maybe the parents are even, they were open-minded, but then at, at age five or six, or even just before school, they were going to the infant school, but, or, or at school from six onwards, and they, they were trained to think in a certain way. But some people, some children had a taste of who they truly were. So, some, so these people, what happened that maybe they get conditioned, they go through life having challenging challenges and, and, and then they, one day they wake up and for them it's easy because they had a taste, they can remember who they truly were, they can remember that they were free, okay, before they got controlled and, all, and so on and so forth. But it's not like that for everybody. And this is when it becomes really challenging. Some children, they are born in families where right from the very beginning, the parents, of course, again, it's not out of nastiness, but they're very controlling. They've got lots of problems. And these kids, some of them, they haven't even had the chance to experience who they truly were. And this is where it's really sad because they never in this particular lifetime knew who they truly were, who they were. So, and I, I, I see them, I see that the people that they hear me talking, for example, or somebody, they say something like me and they look at me and they hear me and they go, what? But of course, because I have power, my words have more power. If I speak to somebody who at some inner deep level, intimate level, I resonate with it because I, that's my job. I resonate with your essence. I resonate. It's all the, all the psychological mambo jumbo. Let me tell you, it's all bananas. It's important, but it's bananas. It's the vibration. It's what the core of it is. I want to resonate with your aliveness. Okay. For some people, it's easy. Some people feel it straight away because it's something they had a taste with, and I resonate with it. They go, ooh, ha, huh. and 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 everything. It's it's. It's not always so easy, but it's easier, easier. But for some people that they never, and believe me, it's sad to say, but some people it's like that, they never had a taste of who they truly were. They can only hear my words, words but they not much resonate with them. Do you see what I mean? And again, uh, I believe in perfection. I truly believe, and I don't just say this because of it's a nice word. I, I, I believe that but when I say perfection, I'm not talking about ideological perfection, which is an illusion. No, I'm not thinking about how things should be. No, no, I've, I'm talking about how things are. So even the person that in this lifetime, it's never, is never, for whatever reason, experience who or she truly is, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's not for me to say, I, here again to see a problem or an opportunity is just what is we can do whatever we can to allow them to be who they truly are to know that they have potential to see opportunities for them maybe where we could think there's a problem and that's all we can do there's nothing else we can do there's always a point in life when it's very important otherwise we add problems to the problems and especially i don't know you guys what you do in life but for example when you do something like i do you want to help people if you are a therapist of any kind one thing that is very important and is that probably the biggest challenge and here again is because you see problem and then then you have to see the opportunity but the opportunity is to be able I mean, to have the honor of doing whatever I can to help somebody, but I'm not a helper. If I think I ha there's a need for me to change something in somebody or that I can truly help them, I mean, I can facilitate something, but they have to do it. But this is to say that to see the perfection and to just do whatever we can with intention, without any, having any expectations, it, allow, it opens a space for us to see opportunities and not problems. Thank you very much 
for sharing, for being with me. The hour is flown by like always. Um, thank you, I wish you a good evening. And now it's gonna be in September, we are gonna be seeing each other in English on Thursday. I can't remember what time, so I'm not saying, I'm gonna say what time, but we are gonna see each other next uh, Thursday, Thursday evening. I'm not sure what time. So, thank you. Marisa, everyone is on their own life journey. We are all at different stages. Yes, yes, I agree. So respect.